Hello, fellow citizens! I am your host, Jess, and this is your reminder that the weight of the entire world is not on your shoulders, and you can make a difference. This podcast is about what it means to be a citizen and neighbor where you live. For me, that's Philadelphia. Today I'm talking with somebody who is also a transplant to Philadelphia and we have a mutual friend here in South Philly that introduced us and I know her dogs really well. Today I'm talking with Alex. Hi Alex. Hi Jess. <laughs> How are you feeling about this? I'm a little nervous but other I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited because when I asked you about this like you knew what you wanted to talk about and so to me that was like encouraging and I think it's definitely I want to share this information with other people and so it's great to talk to somebody who has the information and I think you'll share it in a fun way I hope so (laughs) (laughs) so we're gonna get it um started by talking about where all you've lived we're both transplants to Philadelphia so where are you from and how did you get here? So um, I'm from New York. I'm from Long Island, which you will hear very clearly if and when I say things like dog or <laughs> coffee um, or hor- horrible. I say horrible. Um And um, specifically, I'm from the beach. I'm from Long Beach, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's like closer to Queens, like right. I'm on like the most southern tip of the state of New York. So like I grew up on the beach. Um, I could literally like roll out of my bed and be like on sand in like two minutes. Yeah, it's like really, really nice. Um, But uh, so I grew up there. And I went upstate to college and then I came back because my boyfriend, now my husband, was in Long Beach. So I came home and I moved in with him. And then we broke up for a little while um, when I was in graduate school and I was living in Brooklyn, um, sort of like half living in Brooklyn. And then um, I came back to Long Island when we got back together. Um, and I realized that I really love being in a city and I really didn't want to live in the suburbs anymore. And it was just feeling very like small and kind of claustrophobic. Um, so he and I had been to Philly a couple of times and we had spent some time here. We didn't know anybody or anything, but we were like comfortable here and, and we really like the city and it's enough stimulation for me, but it's not like Manhattan or Brooklyn. So it's like a little less stimulation for him. So before we got married, I said to him, like, you're going to have to do something different, my friend. We're going to have to have an adventure. So he said, OK, and he picked Philly. And here we are. We love it. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. it can be a little it's bit like scary. One of the best decisions we've ever made. Yeah, it's very it is definitely different than Manhattan. Yeah, there's not it, as many people here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's less intense. Like I love Manhattan. There will always be a place in my, listen, if I like rent a closet under the stairs in Manhattan, <laughs> I totally would. But honestly, like being here, I really don't miss it that much. Mm-hmm. I really like, I really love it here. It, it's like just enough of that like city thing where I get my fix without totally overwhelming and alienating him. So it's great. And so, like I said, I know you because we have a mutual friend and you made a lot of friends on your street with your neighbors. Yeah. How did that happen? (laughs) Um, How did that happen? So I I am famous with my friends for like, I talk to everybody. I talk to strangers like online at the grocery store. I talk to my Uber drivers. I talk to like, it, I love to chat with people. I love to meet strangers. I love to like learn about people. Um, and I am notorious for getting pulled out of places because I've been like learning like deeply about this like random person. Um, I, met a, I met a woman in American Eagle in Soho, like a bunch of years ago. And like, we still email, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, right. I just like 
love to bond. I don't know. So, um, so naturally that is something that kind of like comes easy to me. I've always been super friendly. I wouldn't say I always had a lot of friends cause I don't think that's true, but like, I never felt like making friends has never been like super difficult for me either. Um, so when I moved here, I knew that I wanted to be a part of a community that was like really important to me because I never really felt like I fit in at home so much. And so I really wanted to like, come into Philly and, and establish myself here and really like make this my home. Um, and so I came into it with that mindset, but honestly, this block is like, I just got really lucky. <laughs> um, this block is so cool and everyone's been really nice. And, you know, it's been a really great, like very welcoming, very affirming experience being on this block because everybody's like around our age, like in their, in their, early to mid twenties into their like early forties. Um, some young families, most people have dogs. So we have dogs and <laughs> so we're out walking them all the time. So that was an easy way to meet people. And then like meeting other people who have dogs, it's like you have something in common to start having that conversation about. And then honestly, like I think quarantine helped because we were home and we couldn't go anywhere. So it was like, Oh, does anybody want to have like a socially distant, like happy hour? <laughs> so the weather was getting nicer. So we just started like all hanging out. Yeah. So that's yeah. Um, a really great segue to how you've been spending your time during the pandemic. Has it been weird for you? Have there been adjustments? What's your day like? Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. My dog is like <laughs> really hype right now. Stop that. Hey, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's about to get so loud. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> so have you, um, did you only get both dogs during pandemic or you had Sansa before? So we, so, okay. How have we been spending our time? So we honestly have been spending our time being dog parents and it like nothing is better. Um, so we moving to Philly, I found Sansa through a, um, through an adoption website of an agency that we had been like working with basically my whole family. My, my sister got a dog there. My mom is really good friends with um, the woman. They have like an Instagram friendship um, who runs it. It's called true North rescue mission in Brooklyn. And um, I saw Sansa on there and I was like, that's my dog. And we went to go get her. And then two days later we moved down here. So Sansa's a Philly girl pretty much through. through. Um, she's, she's spent her whole life here. Basically we got her at like four months. So she's been here for like her whole life and then quarantine happened. Okay. So my husband got furloughed. Um, he works for, um, he works in retail. So he got furloughed and so he was home and he was going, he was taking some classes and he was, you know, trying to do some stuff and we were hanging out and, um, he's very happy to like be a couch potato. Like he says all the time that like quarantine is like, he's been gearing up his whole life for quarantine. Um, but he said to me one day, he was like, honestly, I really want another puppy. And like, I feel ready for another puppy and you know, I'm not doing anything like now's a great time for us to get one. So I'm never going to say no to a puppy ever. Yeah. And we fostering through an agency here called um, Home at Last. And um, we looked at their website to see about fostering. And then they had our second baby, Brienne. Um, and we were both like, all right, well, that's, she's it. We're not even going to foster her. We're just, she, we saw her instantly. We were like, she's it. And so she, they were both sort of impulse decisions, but they were literally like the best impulse <laughs> we've ever made. And they're the best part of everything it's and so I funny because the last interview I had my guest has a one-year-old baby and so he was like she's in an apartment and so the baby was like in the next room with um her husband the baby's dad and so there was like cries and she's like I'm warning you now like we might hear Micah cry and like I you know well I was like we'll try to work around it and so it's so funny that like now we have Sansa and she's just like rolling I can hear her like rolling all over the place <laughs> So what's happening right now is that Sansa has zoomies and she really wants to play. And Brienne, who is my puppy, who's supposed to like have a little bit more energy, is sleeping um, <laughs> and does not want to play. I love it. And like it's you hear the word puppy and you think small, but these are two like giant dogs. 
Yes, <laughs> Brienne. I'm gonna guess Brienne weighs 100 pounds. Oh! Just, yeah. <laughs> she's um, a big and, she, and she's the best, and she, they're my favorite. So we, so Ruben, my husband, has been gearing up for quarantine his whole life. If he could spend his whole existence on the couch, hanging out, playing video games, and watching movies with me and the girls, he would be in heaven like that's his like idea of like a perfect everything um i need a little bit more stimulation than that (laughs) um and luckily i have lots of friends on my block and um and in philly now so i've been doing lots of socially distant hangs um and that's been great and really like fulfilling and and making me feel sort of well-rounded I'm sad though, because this is my first, like this was my first summer in Philly to really like enjoy Philly now that I have friends here. And I haven't really gotten to do as much like cultural stuff as I had hoped I would get to do. Yeah. Um, so that's disappointing. But I have gotten to do a lot of adventuring and my friends have been really patient because they're talking about stuff. And I'm like, what's that? What's that? What's that? Where's this? What are we doing now? <laughs> So you're not, um, like you're like the new girl on the block almost. I'm the new girl. I'm literally the new girl on the block. Um, and yeah, everybody's been like super welcoming, like I said, and really friendly. So I have been spending my time. I work like 60 hours a week. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And then um, anywhere between like 50 and 60 hours a week. It depends. And then in my free time, I'm with the girls. I'm reading. I'm trying to be better at like really like resting and not doing anything yeah um and then i'm also trying to like have a little bit of a social life oh my goodness yeah they are too much those two puppies i know i am really (laughs) sorry about that that's okay okay i don't want to get into the serious stuff until they like settle down a bit (laughs) let me see if i can kick them out hold on okay are you gonna be done now i'm so sorry that's okay this is real life yeah right <laughs> this is amateur recording <laughs> oh gosh are they okay yeah they're fine they're just she just like really wants to play <laughs> of course i'm here by myself so like oh. i can't i can't really like stop them and i can't call my husband to be like come and get them it's been I'm really interesting right now yes it's been really interesting to talk to different people because some people are like, oh, yeah, I do Zoom calls like every day. I know how to do this. And other people are like, I've never done this before. I don't know what to expect. And then, yeah, like you're you're just in your house. And so you never know. I never know like what to expect. But at the end yeah. of the day, as long as the information gets through. <laughs> I Zoom all the time, but with the caveat of like I say to people, like there is a good chance that my dogs are going to be very loud, playful barking whatever so everybody just kind of like knows this um, and i was hoping we went for a walk right before this so i was hoping they'd be tired <laughs> oh so, well, very sorry that's okay we'll figure it out okay yeah. so we're um um oh, oh my god we're like nine months no we're, is it nine months into this pandemic March, April, oh, my god. oh my god and so, so with your work, are you always out of the house or can you work from home at all? So full time, I work for an agency in Bryn Mawr um, doing like community social work. And so two days a week, um, the agency runs a food pantry. And so two days a week, I am in the food pantry. So Tuesdays and Thursdays, I am in person in the food pantry doing social work. Um, with anybody who comes in or needs anything. So that's my in-person stuff. Working from home, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm still social working, uh, just remote, because I don't need to be in person because the pantry's not open. Okay. And then in a part-time capacity, I work for an agency um, actually in New York um, doing teletherapy with anywhere between like 10 and 20 clients, depending on the week. Um, doing like mental health counseling, like like therapy. So that you've been doing since you moved to Philly, like the remote. Yeah, but oh, that good. picked up much more like since March. Yeah, I've been working way more. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So you have the the social work aspect. So how did you get into social work and therapy? That's a great question. Uh, I'm a really good client. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> my mom works in mental health. My mom's a school psychologist. And so I am a person who I like very much am a verbal processor. So therapy has always been really helpful to me. Um, so partially, I think it's, you know, that I'm really comfortable talking about feelings and that there's, there's really no subjects with me that are taboo ever. Um, so it's like who I am as a person. Again, I love to talk to strangers and get to know people. So that like naturally lends itself to therapy in a lot of ways. Um, I'm comfortable in a therapeutic setting. Um, I like school, like a big part of therapy is academia and I really like school and I really liked grad school and the process of like reading and researching and writing papers and all of that is like exciting and interesting to me and like reading about theory and like all that kind of stuff. Um, I got into it. I guess you feel like some people feel like a call, you know, mm -hmm. um, to whatever they're chosen. Like I'm sure, you know, for you like broadcast stuff and, and entertaining and like all that kind of stuff like that to me seems like a nightmare. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you feel called to do something. So it was partially that. And then when I was after graduate school, um, I had a good friend of mine who was transitioning from um, female to male and, and um, was having a really hard time accessing services to help like get um, to get surgeries and get mental health treatment and get medicine and like all that kind of stuff. And I was watching that happen and I was really noticing that like social workers function as gatekeepers and it's something that like never sat well with me, you know, but like this is something that needs to happen in the, with the way that our country is set up. Um, and that social workers act as agents of change and can implement different policies and run different things. I like the idea of working in a therapeutic setting. So, you know, it was kind of like once I like cracked the door open, I was like, oh, okay, that's the direction I want to go in. Wait, I'm going to try to kick them out. Hold on. Okay. Enough. Move. Okay. Yay! <laughs> it's so loud that it might be less loud. Yeah. So we'll uh, just take like a short, a little step back. So yeah. you're in social work. You said you have one full time and one part time job. Mm -hmm. And can you just expand a little bit more on what those two roles are? Yeah. Um, so full time, I work in crisis intervention and case management. So basically, I work for an agency that works with an older population, a disabled population, um, a low income population predominantly. So they're having some kind of crisis and then they get me involved and then I help manage the crisis, whatever that is. Um, so it could be a housing crisis, it could be a mental health crisis, it could be a health crisis, whatever, and then I would get involved or the agency would get involved and then I would help to like manage that. Um, on a calmer day, <laughs> um, I do case management. So people, um, again, you know, a lot of our participants, they have a lot going on. So my job is to help them make sure that they're meeting their deadlines, getting their paperwork in, coordinating care, um, that I'm advocating for them the whole way through like that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of supportive counseling in that role, but it's not a therapy role. It's really more of a, um, like a case management role. Um, so traditionally when people hear social work, they think about case management. Mm -hmm. That's like, I do a more traditional social work role full time, but my experience um, has always been in, counseling and therapy specifically with people who are um who use substances and have substance abuse disorders or co-occurring like substance abuse and mental health disorders um i also have a pretty extensive history of working with people who are involved in the criminal justice system so like parole probation alternatives to incarceration like that type of thing um and that's really like where my heart is like i love to do that. <laughs> what did you have to, what kind of courses did you have to take at school or like what, and what's your degree in? Because it just seems like it, you have to know like so many different fields. You do. Um, so social work is a really, really general degree to get, whether you do it as your undergrad or your graduate degree, which is kind of what drew me specifically to like social work, because there's so many things that you can do with a social work degree. 
Um, so she's back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, so there's so many things you can do with a social work degree. So I took a bunch of classes in graduate school, to be honest with you. I'm not sure that any of them helped make my decision. It was really more about like working in the field and figuring out what I liked and what I didn't like. Mm -hmm. So like right now I have a bunch of clients who are in their early adulthood. Um, specifically I have a lot of female clients, but I have a lot of like you know, a, a lot of mix, but I love to talk to early adult, like early adulthood um, and adolescents about like sex and puberty. I love to talk about like boners and condoms and like all that kind of stuff. Like my favorite. I'm like, where are you getting hair? What's going on with you sexually? Like, I love to do that kind of stuff. Um, and that's just like a, that's just like a thing. That's a personal thing. <laughs> you know, you can't teach that. Yeah. Um, most people cringe at that conversation i love it i like I'm like when was the last time you masturbated like i love having that conversation um i love to talk to people about their substance abuse issues like i said you know i like to hear about um like psychosis and like all that kind of stuff is like interesting to me um so it's there's not like a course that you could take it's really just a matter like i was talking to my coworker earlier and she said you know that she loves to work with the older population that we work with and she wants to work with clients who have dementia i really struggle in that that's that doesn't like connect for me and there's really not a course that you could there are courses but you have to kind of try stuff on and see how it goes if you work for a nonprofit, which is all almost all of my experience if you work for a nonprofit, you will end up wearing a million hats just because nonprofits don't have any money and they're all understaffed yeah. um so i have been very fortunate in that i've gotten in like the six years that i've been practicing i have gotten a ton of experience but it's really just you know it's just experience really yeah that's great that you found like where you want to hone in on. That's fascinating. I'm definitely like using all that puberty talk as the teaser for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, let me think. Okay, yeah. So I wanted to bring you on the podcast because I had seen on your social media that you were um, collecting some funds and food to feed families for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so I was wondering, like, how did that go? What did you collect? And where did those donations end up? So one of the greatest honors, I'm going to say, of my very brief professional experience has been getting involved with food insecurity. Um, and I feel really, really passionately about food insecurity and, and working to kind of shift that and correct that, particularly in Philly. Um, but everywhere, you know? Um, so one of the things that drew me to this job was that we have this food pantry. So I collected the money um, and the food and all the donations for Eldernet, which is the agency that I work at. Um, we distributed gift cards and food for Thanksgiving for, I want to say like 200 families on the main line this Thanksgiving. Oh, wow somewhere around there, like 180, maybe a little bit more. Um, all together from just my Instagram post, I collected $430. Wow. It was, a, it was honestly, it was really great. The people that I know are super generous. It was really nice. Yeah, I know. I've talked to Paul and Ashley before when they were um, collecting um, funds to get snacks for the resource center mm -hmm. at the park at your block. And yeah. they said like it was instantaneous and like everybody is just so ready and willing to contribute. You're surrounded by some really awesome people. I'm so happy for I you. Really <laughs> I'm really am. I really am. I have the best neighbors. My friend, everybody's really jealous. I have a great. <laughs> and honestly, it was just luck. I didn't do I didn't do anything. I, I got really lucky. I have the best neighbors. And so right now um, we're recording this early December. And so that was like November. Mm -hmm. And. I'm wondering if you have advice for our listeners in Philadelphia and then also like a general um, idea for everyone across the nation, how they can help their neighbors who are facing food insecurity even after the holidays. It's a big question. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Yes. Uh, I would love to, I would love to like individually, like if people were like, Oh, you know, I want to get involved in this, but I don't know how, um, I would love to, you know, sit down with anybody and have that conversation in more detail. So I'm going to try to be brief, but I'm not always great at that. (laughs) One of the first things that I'm going to say is that when we think about people who are in need, we tend to think with sympathy and not with empathy. So it's like, it's more of like an awe, you know, as opposed to like putting yourself in that person's shoes. Um, and so no judgment, you know, um, but I do think it's important to consider like, what are your attitudes personally about people who are in need? Um, are you a beggars can't be choosers person or are you not? Uh, do you feel more comfortable donating money? Do you feel more comfortable donating food? Do you feel more comfortable donating clothes? Like, you know, where do your personal feelings align with there is an agency or, or a fund or whatever out there for you. It's really just a matter of like being honest with yourself about where you're at. Um, and then donating or getting involved appropriately um i am not a beggars can't be choosers person i don't believe in that i i um i want to give people as many options as i possibly can at all times um and i think that people in need should should have preferences and and be treated you know fair equitably um so for me that looks like mutual aid Um, And I think that's one of the most important things that you can do for your community. And if you don't have mutual aid in your community, I suggest that you start it because I guarantee that even if you live in a really, really fancy neighborhood, there are people who need it. Um, So what does mutual aid look like? So in South Philly, we have um, several fridges, community fridges where people can just like anonymously put food. It can be cooked food, it can be prepackaged food, whatever, but you can put it in the fridge or the freezer and then people who are in need can go and pick it up. Um, There's also different agencies. So you and I had spoken prior to this about, there's um, a agency in uh, North Philly um, called The Block Gives Back, which is like a bunch of guys who I think are like friends from high school who get together every Saturday with a a bunch of their other friends and distribute hot cooked meals to people. They don't ask questions. They literally just cook and distribute. They're really wonderful. They run the Philly um, season of Queer Eye. Um, There's in South Philly by us, there's um, Homies Helping Homies. um, And that's Point Breeze specific. Um, there's tons of like churches have been doing mutual aid stuff for a really long time. Um, there's somebody else who I'm not thinking about. I wrote it down. This um, is why we write stuff down. Yes. This is why I write <laughs> stuff down. Cause I'm like, okay, what am I missing? Oh, the uh, bunny hop? The bunny hop. Thank you so much. So the <laughs> bunny hop is like, I think they're like a West Philly. I honestly don't know enough about them to speak in an educated way, but they, I think are a West Philly group, but they're like slowly working their way around the city. Cause I've seen a lot of stuff through the bunny hop. Um, and they do a bunch of community fridges, um, and mutual aid. So it's like crowdfunding for people who are in need. So, um, so it, food insecurity looks like a lot of things besides just food. It's housing, it's shelter, it's clothes, it's, um, education, it's like all different stuff. So if somebody is able to crowdfund with their community and you're able to like help build up the people in your community and make sure that their basic needs are being met, that includes food, but it's not limited to that. So I think personally mutual aid is, and like a community, small community focus is the best. But again, this is totally about a personal preference and no matter what you're helping people, um, in the Philadelphia area, there's also agencies like Phil Abundance. So Phil Abundance feeds tons of families. Our, um, our food bank is actually stocked a lot of the time with Phil Abundance. We have a partnership with them. Um, and that they're incredible. They're also having a hard time because I don't know if you heard that they got hacked. <gasps> And they, so Phil Abundance got like robbed, I think like um, about a million dollars. Um, and they've been 
consistently distributing to families through, I mean, for a really long time, but specifically throughout the pandemic. Yeah. That is the sad, like, whoever hacked them. Yeah. Like, it's karma's not- gonna get them, but also it's like, wait, like, did you just do it for the money? Be Like... I don't understand. Oh, my God. Yeah. That breaks my heart. Yeah, know, I'll look into really, that. It's really sad. So um, so Phil Abundance could use some money. Yeah. Um, but then there's also, you know, there's lots of local stuff. There's lots of local nonprofits that need your money. There's lots of local shelters that need your money. There's a lot. I mean, you know, if, if you feel like you want to donate money to an agency because that feels more appropriate, like, um, homeless shelters are amazing. Covenant House in Philly does incredible stuff for homeless youth, particularly LGBT people. Um, the Mazzoni Center, the William Way Community Center, like there's tons of options. You just have to like scratch the surface a little bit. Wow. And I know sometimes like I hear people who do donate money and they almost like feel kind of weird about it. They're like, oh, I like I know. Is that enough? And I'm like, heck, yeah, that seems like more than yeah. enough. It's good that you have the funds to do that. So speaking as a person who works for a nonprofit, a very small nonprofit, like we literally have a staff of seven people. um, There is no small amount. If you gave us 50 cents in the year like that, I noticed that, like, you know what I mean? Like we noticed that's so important. And it really is the thought that counts. And if you don't have the money, you could donate your time. You could donate sharing on Instagram is free. Yeah. You know, um, you don't, you can donate your time just by like getting involved and doing the reading. I love it's, this. It's like, not, it doesn't always have to be financial. You can physically volunteer. Yeah. You know, you physically go and volunteer and hand out food or supplies or whatever it is. This is great. Do you think you can send me some, um, links to these places and I can put them in the episode description? Absolutely. Yahoo! Yeah, definitely. And like I said, you know, I would be happy to talk to people about like, how do you choose? Like, how do you get involved and how do you make decisions? Because it just seems like there's so many things and everybody needs something. And particularly right now, like the world is just like so. How would you, um, if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, where would they find you? Um, that's a great question. You could totally reach out to me on Instagram. Um, that is like more than reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll send you my stuff so that you can post it. Um, and I'll send you my email too. Okay, great. Yeah, so it'll be be linked. I love this. Like, I think every season is the giving season. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, because there is no like time that people are less hungry or more hungry. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking with me about this. I it's funny because like you say like you chat with people so easily whereas like I always have questions but I'm not always the best at asking them. And so this podcast has been a great way for me to be like, "Hey, let's choose a time and let's sit down and talk." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I imagine that this has been, I mean, therapy works that way too. Like yeah. you are in the headspace of like sharing and asking questions. Yeah, this podcast has been my therapy. Some days are easier than others because like this, the hardest part for me was like making up the questionnaire because I'm like, oh, I want to, you know, first we had to like kind of have a, a back and forth in the email to figure out what exactly to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. And then with me, it's just picking out the best questions and like making sure the answers are, you know, full enough for the listeners. And so I've talked to a handful of different people for this season. Last season, it was just about the ballots. And so it was good to have guests on because I didn't have to do the research by myself because it was so much <laughs> research. <lot>. It's- <laughs> I, listened to, um, I listened to Paul and Ashley's episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, prior just to get a feel you know yeah um, oh my god the puppy is chasing her tail right now and it's really cute oh my um, god yeah it's really sweet <laughs> um and uh and um i was impressed by how much research they had both done yeah. i was like wow dense i was really excited and like it made me proud to be their friend <laughs> I learned a lot from yeah. those episodes about the ballots. I mean, I just voted kind of blindly. I should have been listening to your podcast. I wish I had known about it. <laughs> well, now we know for the next local election. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna, actually going to have people on again, like, 
after the inauguration and we're going to do some follow ups on the people who were on the ballots, whether or not they won, because if they ran, I would hope they're still doing stuff, even though they didn't win that role. Yeah. But this has been a good like um more casual kind of conversation that is still about being neighborly because at the end of the day I want my podcast to focus on how people can try to make a difference where they live because I I think in 2020 that's been the hardest question I know especially when the news of George Floyd um broke on social media so many people are like well what do I do what do I do what do I do and I think for some people it can be really overwhelming to think that you can't do enough but you know, unless you live, I mean, even if you live in the middle of nowhere, you can always do something to make a difference. You can always do something. <laughs> um, and you can always do something. And it is really overwhelming. Like, mm-hmm. it really overwhelming. I mean, I live with a lot of privilege. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of guilt that comes along with that. And a lot of, um, a lot of, like responsibility, like, oh, okay, well, I'm a social worker and I'm white and I, um, you know, and my parents very fortunately were able to like put me through college and help me financially with stuff. And if I ever got stuck, I, you know, I could call my mom and say like, hey, I'm really sorry, but I need, you know, whatever. And because I enjoy all of those things and I think a lot of people do, um, it feels like, oh my God, this is all too big. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting thrown all this stuff out of nowhere and I had no idea. And it feels very, it's very overwhelming and it's hard to reconcile your own stuff and also deal with the world and, and also deal with COVID and being in lockdown and maybe you hate your partner or maybe you love your partner and you know and you just want them to go away (laughs) um um, you know we're all processing a lot of trauma right now all all the time all the time this election was traumatic it's been a very very hard year um there is always something that you can do and that might just be like just learning maybe you don't do anything right now yeah racism will still be here in a year maybe you just learn and feel what you're feeling and process those emotions for a little while and then you you know take it to whatever that action step would look like for you I think those are all great words because um you said responsibility and I think that sticks out a lot because definitely like we have to educate ourselves, which is great. And so, you know, with knowledge comes power and with power mm-hmm. comes responsibility. And so once you're prepared and actually know what's going on in the world around you, it's kind of your duty to either share that knowledge with people or if you have the ability to, you know, take action, then you should be. So I think yeah. people are doing their best this year and hopefully people 2021 are doing will be their better. best no matter what, even yes. if their best looks shitty. Yeah. I curse. Yo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, people are always doing their best. And that's the thing that I say to people like in, you know, when I'm doing therapy with them, it's like, we're all doing our best. It's just that like some days your best is 20% and some days it's negative and some days it's a hundred and you, you know, and different people are at different points. Yeah, I try to think about that more now when I feel like somebody has wronged me, like if they kind of like cut me off on the street or something silly like that, if like they seem like they don't notice me and bump into me in the grocery store or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm not going to get mad about it because we're all just trying to get by. Like they, yeah. they're not trying to hurt me, so I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts about that, but like even if they are, like you know, how how involved do you need to get in that and like does it does it impact you so like for example i know there's a lot of people who truly don't care that much about black lives matter there's a lot of people who are like well all lives matter um (laughs) and you have you know that feels really personal right if you care um and you want to shake people sometimes and be like, yes, all lives matter. That's the point. Right. Like, all lives matter can't matter until black people matter. Yeah. Uh, and I get like that and I get very like emotionally tied to stuff. And I, 
I think that feels alienating a lot of the time for some people because they're not ready to hear that. So it's like, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you like do your due diligence and like have the hard conversations, but also do it in a way that's palatable, but also like you're not like feeding into like the same like toxic systems. Yeah. It's a fine line. I am still figuring it out for sure myself. And I've been working on my own racism for almost 10 years, I want to say. And it still feels complicated. And again, we're just all doing the best that we can because in that 10 years, my roles have changed a lot. So like I've been sort of working on like, how does that function as like when I worked with people who were incarcerated, who are involved in the criminal justice system, most of those people were black. Well, okay, like, how do I fit into that? Do I get to have opinions about certain things? My friends who are black, like, how am I relating to them? Am I doing like microaggressions? I didn't even know what microaggressions were until recently. Well, I, the last five I actually, years. I saw that the, you have a book on your coffee table. Do you remember what the book is or who the author is about racism? Oh, um, I think it's called like so you want to read about yes it's so you want to talk about race oh okay there's a few books on my coffee table that's I was like wait which one is it <laughs> yes okay. so, um that was actually lent to me by another um therapist in Philly oh who's really cool I'm not gonna shout her out just because I don't know if she would want me to do that mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but um this is the book cover and I can share that with you. Nice. Uh, and I haven't finished this particular book yet, but I am enjoying it. It's an interesting read. I also did the white supremacy, me and white supremacy workbook. Whoa. Um, and I've done that twice through. Um, um, and I'm trying to think, um, I've done a lot of reading, but it's a it's like a very it's a much bigger conversation there's oh, yeah. so much there's so much like if you want to work on <laughs> like unlearning your racism yeah that's like a whole other podcast episode because i could literally go on i'm trying to think of like audrey lord bell hooks um um in the instagram space rachel cargill is doing really amazing things she she rose if you want to talk about like mutual aid she she rose has raised like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for black people um who are in you know difficult situations um then i mean i, I could i could go on there's tons of <laughs> well maybe tons we'll of- have to do we'll have yeah. another episode um, like maybe next month or something. Yeah. And we can focus on that. I just think it's great that like you have all this information and you're ready to share it. Do you mind telling our listeners how old you are? I just had my 31st birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to think about it? I yeah. <laughs> I only you know, ask. Like in my 30s, I'm like, I don't know. Right. I only ask because I feel like there are some people, um, and I don't know that I have a lot of older listeners right now but I know that there are some older people who look down on like people in their 20s and 30s and they think like we don't know enough Mm -hmm. and so I'm really excited to know a lot of people right now who maybe have been learning and sharing their knowledge for a while or maybe just this year because of a lot of different factors are finally educating themselves and that's how we have like better conversations I think I've been noticing that like with older people and I hate to always be like, okay, boomer. Um, (laughs) I I think that with older people that when you, when they talk and think about racism, the attitude was always about that color blindness was actually like the solution. Mm -hmm. And we know better now. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to do better but I think that for a lot of people particularly people who grew up in a time of colorblindness or if that was like the goal and also people who you know it wasn't cool to be PC up until recently right like social justice wasn't something I mean I grew up in the 90s and the early aughts and social justice was not like hip yeah (laughs) it wasn't cool it wasn't your like tiny Von Dutch 
hat, your Von Dutch hat in your like tiny bag. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Paris Hilton was wearing like the super low cut jeans, but she wasn't talking about Black Lives Matter. I mean, I guess right. she's probably not now either, but, um, <laughs> but like that wasn't like cool and discuss. Now we've made this huge cultural shift and people are talking about this stuff all the time, which is so amazing. So, I mean, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, you know, we've done a really good job of like shifting and now it's really just about like keeping up with that momentum. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a really interesting time to be alive and hopefully everybody realizes what they're, (laughs) what they're, powers are of like well, what yeah. can i do like what do i have in me to contribute oh my god i'm sorry <laughs> well, that's okay. i think that's our cue to wrap it up oh, <laughs> did so you sorry. have anything else you want to share before we end um no i don't think so you seem I mean, exhausted you're like this is so much which i totally get like it's a lot it is a lot and also i feel like i just dog drama the whole time <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. That's okay. Alex, thank you so very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It was really, despite the dog drama, it was a blast. I had so much fun. Yeah. um, You know, I hope that people feel like they really do, are, they really are agents of change. Mm Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, Listeners, you can DM me on the Instagram and let me know about like your local food banks and your mutual aid in your area. Um, I'm on Instagram as thisjess, T-H-I-S-J-E-S. And I'll see you around the neighborhood. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Bye. (laughs) Bye.